Hello, it's Jeffrey Christian of CPM Group. It's about 4.10 the afternoon on Friday, the 14th of uh, April in New York. Um, I'm recording this for release on Tuesday, the 18th of April, uh, because we have logistical issues that will prohibit us making a video on that morning. So a little bit of a head. And I wanted to talk about this topic for some time but the exigencies of the markets have precluded me dedicating a video to it. So I'm going to talk about institutional investment trends in really the, the mining industry. Um, the presentation here is largely a presentation I made at the PDAC on the 3rd of March in 2020, just before the world shut down, two weeks uh, before uh, the global lockdown and the pandemic uh, was declared. Um, I CPM Group had done research as part of a series of research reports for a research group related to the PDAC, part of the PDAC actually, uh, related to, uh, we've done a series of studies related to investing in the mining industry in uh, Canada uh, and Yes, you know, the majority of mining companies probably in the world are listed on the TSX. So it's a very important part of the capital markets in, in, in Canada. Uh, so as a result of having done that study in 2019, we were asked to do a, a small presentation at the PDAC convention in Toronto in March of 2020, which we did. I modified it a little bit here uh, to emphasize a few other things. But, you know, basically what we've been seeing for some time is a shift in the way institutional investors invest in the mining industry. And, you know, again, we were focusing on Canadian listed junior mining exploration companies, but the same is true is actually across the mining industry uh, and with particular focus on the precious metals uh, mining industry. And the study that we did was initially designed to be an initial exploration into topics related to how institutional investors looked at mining investments and how they actually practiced uh, investing in mining industry uh, based on their attitudes toward the, the industry. Um, it was about the same time, maybe a couple of years after Barrick had made a run into uh, to, to buy Newmont Gold, uh, which failed. Um, and at the time, there were people who were saying, well, you know, the mining industry has become so unimportant to institutional investors that um, Evie Hambro's Natural Resource Fund, that's part of the BlackRock uh asset management company, doesn't even own any Barrick shares. Uh, and I asked my colleague, Carlos Sanchez, is that true? And he went into our database and said, actually, there were 65 BlackRock funds that owned Barrick shares at that time, at the time of the run. And of the 65 BlackRock sh funds that own shares in the same company, um, 60 of them were driven by computers. They were index funds or ETFs, uh, or they, they were, their buy and sell recommendations were driven by computers. Five of them were driven by people managing them, studying the industries, uh, and saying, yes, we want to buy Barrick shares. One of them was E.B. Hambro's Natural Resource Fund, by the way, uh, and he did own it, and the uh, pundit in Canada who said that no one at BlackRock owned Barrick shares was wrong. Uh, but that actually anecdote leads to one of the issues within the institutional investment market, which is you have a plethora of funds. I mean, BlackRock and any number of other asset management companies will have hundreds, if not thousands, of different funds that you could buy into, indexed funds, ETFs, mutual funds. And there's a tremendous amount of co-investment among those funds. So you think you're diversifying your portfolio, 
by buying a Canadian fund, a natural resource fund, a generalist fund, a value fund. But if you look at the, the, the shares that those funds have, oftentimes there's a great deal of cross-investing among those same funds. So your portfolio is not as diversified as you had thought. Anyway, we did this study in 2019. There were 951 companies that could be considered mining exploration funds listed on the TSX and the TSX Venture Exchange. Of those, 832 had market caps of less than 50 million at the end of 2018. So we were looking at really like 120, 119 companies that had market caps over 50 million. And the study was designed to really focus on companies that had more than $50 million in market cap uh, in the period 2007 to 2018. We reviewed institutional shareholding patterns for 13 of those companies, broadly representing the mining industry in South, in, in, listed in, in Toronto that had more than market cap. And we conducted, we, we did study, a data study, to see institutional ownership of those 13 companies. But then we also conducted interviews with 16 fund managers at asset management groups that were run by banks or general funds or hedge funds or private equity companies or specialist funds or other types of institutional investors to have a two-part study. Um, what we found was, and this is past half decade to 2020, so we're really going back to 2015, there had been, and there continues to be since 2020, a contraction of institutional investing interest in the mining industry. Uh, there are several major, large, small, prominent mining investors, and um, others have exited the junior mining investment market. We looked at the reasons cited by institutional investors for pulling away from direct investing in mining companies. And what we found was that there were six broad categories. And of those six, five of them actually had nothing to do with mining. They had to do with secular, long-term, quasi-permanent structural changes in financial markets. The way asset men the way investors give their money to asset managers to manage, and then the asset managers invest that money or deploy it in the markets. And what we were finding was that the buy side, as well as the sell side of the institutional investment industry, was going through massive changes uh, that had negative implications for the mining industry. The last point here, disenchantment with the mining sector's performance on a financial or investment basis on quantitative, qualitative, and relative to other investments. That had to do with the mining industry and the buy side and institutional investment managers' attitudes toward the mining industry. But the other five factors had nothing to do with mining per se. And that's a real problem for the mining industry because insofar as the mining industry wants capital appreciation, wants capital to develop their companies, what they're finding is there is a divorce between capital formation for companies and equity markets. And that divorce has nothing to do with mining. It's not limited to mining. It's across industries. And it has to do with structural changes in the buy side and the sell side of the financial markets, of the institutional investment market. That means that there's really nothing that a mining company or a mining industry can do to improve the flow of capital from institutional investors to the mining industry. These are issues that are beyond the control of the mining industry. They're beyond the purview of the mining industry. They are bigger issues in the financial market. What were they? Well, changes in the macroeconomic environment, one set of them. But then there are these secular transformation. There's revenue compression, the institutional, the pension funds and others that give money to institutional investors uh, to manage were complaining about the cost. Why are we paying more? 
there were cost pressures on the buy side industry. Hey, reduce your fees to your clients. And the revenues were, were becoming more compressed. There were also revenue pressures and cost increases and major transformations going on in the sell side of the financial markets, some of which, many of which actually had reflected changes on the buy side. So with the increased number of institutional investors who were trading electronically, they were still paying brokerage fees in 2020, and they're still paying some brokerage fees now, but the brokerage fees keep contracting uh, um, for the, the sell side institutions. But they were saying, wait a second, all I'm doing is I'm having my traders, you know, input s trades on your platform. But I'm paying a brokerage fee as if it's the good old days when my traders call your traders and say, I want to sell X number of shares of this mining company, and you work the order. Then going back to the buy side, the man your senior management says, wait a second, I've got traders who are inputting trades. The portfolio managers could do that. Yeah, you know, we we why do we even have a trading desk? And going back to BlackRock, which is you know a focal point because it's the largest asset management company in the world with trillions of dollars under ma management. Uh, you know, senior management has said, you know, we'd like to get rid of our trading desk. We'd like to get rid of our portfolio managers too, because quite frankly, the indexed funds and ETFs have been outperforming the human managed funds more often than not. Not every year, not every quarter. Sometimes the human funds do better, but more often than not, uh, the ETFs and indexed funds and computer generated buy and sell recommendations have been beating the humanly traded uh, fund. And they've been doing that not by trying to pick which mining company to invest in and which mining company to avoid, but by doing it on an indexed basis. And again, it's a movement away from smaller companies and direct investments in those companies rather than a movement away from mining. So big problems there. Now, you know, I think my next slide back from then, basically the same sort of thing. And I think I've talked about all of these issues already. Uh, obviously in the ensuing three years, ESG and environmental and government and sustainability issues have come up, and those have put a further onus on institutional investors to justify investing in mining, even as it's being offset by the realization that there's a lot of metals mining that needs to be financed and developed in order to have the metals necessary for the energy transition. So there are big changes going on. Um, let me see what else I might have here. And the sell side transformation, the same sort of thing. So what happens? Well, one of the things that's happening now, which is very interesting, is that in the past, let's say an auto company was looking at long-term platinum, palladium, and rhodium supplies, and they had concerns. And they would see a company that was possibly was exploring or or uh, doing the research or pre-development research on a platinum group metals property. And they would say, it would be great if that company had the financing it needed to move that property, that deposit, into development and then later production. The auto company wouldn't invest in the company directly. They would go to the asset management companies that were managing the auto company's pension funds and other investments and say, it would be great if your fund were to invest some money into the XYZ exploration company or development company. And that's how manufacturers who were worried about long-term supplies or wanted to encourage development of mines to meet their long-term supplies tended to deal with it. 10, 15 years ago, there was a shift and you started seeing with some companies some metals, not so much PGMs, uh, although you saw some PGMs, but molybdenum in particular is one that we're uh, aware of, where you would see steelmakers saying, we're going to need long-term molybdenum supplies. They wouldn't necessarily buy into the company, although we did work with one steel company 
uh, that invested into the property, not at the corporate level, but at the property level, um, on a molybdenum property, uh, what they would do is they would have offtake agreements. And offtake agreements have become more popular over the last two years as the auto industry and the electronics industry and other manufacturers have realized that they're probably facing tight supplies of commodities going forward. But the other thing that we've started to see just in the last 18 months is some companies, including auto companies, actually taking a direct investment in mining companies. And that's something that wasn't done in the past, at least not in the recent past several decades. It might have been done at the late 18th century, uh, 19th century, early 20th century. Now, putting all this together, we have been saying to mining clients of ours for years that they shouldn't try to grow their company in terms of volumes of ounces being produced, but rather they should focus on the dollars of profits and the profit margins that they're making. Because what they really want to do is not necessarily build a company that's big enough to attract the largest fund management companies. They want to build a company that's profitable enough to attract the specialist funds and others that are still interested in investing on a company-by-company -company basis. And we've said for decades now, and it still is true, and it's probably more true than it was 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, that if you look at it, there are specialist fund management companies out there still worthy to pay attention to, uh, still focusing on individual companies. Private equity is making a increased strides really across industry, not just mining, but across industry. And there are several problems with private equity that I won't bore you with right now, but it is something that is happening and it's going to continue to happen uh, because there's no political incentive on the part of governments and regulators to, to take a, a different approach toward regulating private equity. Family offices are very important, and high net worth individuals are very important. So we look at the mining industry, and we say, you're seeing big changes on institutional investment. Uh, we've seen these coming. This is no black swan. This has been around for decades as a long emerging trend. And, and you really need to focus on specific funds and family offices and individual investors who understand the rationale for owning shares in gold mining companies and silver mining companies. And that's a, another entirely different topic that maybe we'll talk about soon, uh, the wisdom of owning mining companies as well as metals and the different, the significant differences uh, for an investor to own mining companies as well as physical metals. But for now, what we're saying is one of the issues that we're facing in the mining business is identifying those institutional investors and family offices and, and specialist firms that still are interested in hearing good stories about worthwhile exploration and mining development companies. That's what we have. I'll talk to you later in the week. Take care of yourself and those around you. And take care of the rest of the world.